Well, today I'm going to be speaking about living with limitless love. So if you have a Bible, please turn to John chapter 15, and we're going to read from verse 9. The beginning of my sermon, I'm just warning you, it's going to be a little bit intense because you're going to hear things that you think, is that really in the Bible? That's why I'm teaching from the Bible. But it's so important in the Bible to take everything in its context. So they taught us in Bible college, don't just take one little scripture and, and preach a doctrine from it. Share everything in its context. Amen. So I think it's important as Christians that we share things in, our con in its context. Otherwise, we can get off into weird and wonderful doctrine. So what I love about this church, we are Holy Spirit Church. Amen. Amen. But we're also a word church. We believe in the word of God. That is the foundation for everything we believe in, everything we stand for, and everything that we hold dear. But we also believe in the power of God and the gifts of the Spirit. So that's a great combination. My mentor, Reinhard Bonnke, always used to say, if you have only the Word and no Holy Spirit, you dry up. But if you have only the Holy Spirit and no Word, you blow up. But if you have the Word and the Holy Spirit, you grow up. Amen. So I believe we are all growing up. John 15 verses 9, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Let's just pause for a second. Jesus is saying, as my Father loved me. Now, how much does God the Father love Jesus? In Africa, we have a word say, that says too much. Too much. That means like you can't even describe it. It's so great. So the love that God the Father has for Jesus is too much. Say too much. And here Jesus is saying, with that same intensity and love that my Father loves me, I love you. So how much does Jesus love you? Too much. Too much. <laughs> so when you come to Africa, you'll, you'll know some of the lingo. I have loved you, abide in my love. So it's one thing to know and have a revelation of how much God loves you and to walk in that love, but it's important that we abide in that love. And what does it mean to abide in that love? It means to live in that love, to have a revelation every moment of every day that I am loved by God. I am blessed and highly favored. I had this one friend of mine in Africa, a Nigerian brother, and he said, you know, I know God doesn't have favorites, but I'm sure I'm one of his favorites. <laughs> and, and that's a revelation you need to have. I am one of God's favorites. Amen. Abide in my love. If, uh-oh, say uh-oh. Now we don't like this word if as Christians. We don't like conditions. We just want everything. However, the word of God teaches us that, that there are conditions in this walk with the Lord. He says, if. Now that word if means on condition that. Allowing that. In the event that. So what I love and appreciate about Jesus is everything is, is available to us. If you want to know anything about God, you don't have to imagine it. You don't have to fantasize about it or watch Hollywood movies to kind of think, what is God like? You just have to open the word of God. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So what Jesus is saying to us, he's given us a blueprint to abide in the love of God. What he's saying to us is that we must keep in the word. The word of God are his statutes, are his commandments. He's encouraging us to stick in the rules. If you want to be successful at your sport, you have to obey the, the rules. 
If you want to be a great tennis player, you can't just hit the ball out of bounds in the, in the tram lines. They're going to call it out. And you're going to keep wondering, why doesn't the umpire like me? Why does it keep calling out? Because, brother, you have to hit the ball inside the court. And as Christians, we need to follow the rules. We need to follow the regulations because they are there for our defense. They are there for our protection. If you say, Johnny, your little kid, Johnny, Johnny, don't run in the highway, and Johnny runs in the highway and doesn't listen to you, Johnny runs the risk of getting hit. So it's not that God wants to punish us by giving us the commandments and the rules and and his statutes. It's there for our protection. So Jesus is saying, if you want to be protected, if you want to abide in my love, keep my word. Verse 11, these things I've spoken to you that your joy may remain. So God promises us joy. Joy, joy is not happiness. Happiness is sometimes conditional of what you are going through. If you're having a good day, you're happy. If, if you're getting a promotion, you're happy. But joy is deep from within your spirit. Joy is something that God gives you that is not dependent on your situation. I know some people, they, they live in a tin shack but they have such joy in their heart because their name is written in the Lamb's book of life. They have so much joy knowing that their sins are forgiven and that if they live for God, their potential in Him is great. If a billionaire were to look at that brother in the Lord, they would feel sad and sorry for them, but that person in that condition is not feeling sad or sorry. They're full of joy because they know the God of the universe is backing them up. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Note it's a little bit conditional. If you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. God wants our fruit to remain. What is our fruit? Our fruit is the things that we started, the people that we invested to, into, people that you've helped lead to the Lord, people that you've encouraged to keep following the Lord, people that you've encouraged to fulfill their destiny. These things I've commanded you that you love one another. So to live the limitless life, we need to do a few things. I'm going to name some of them today. Number one, First and foremost, we need to experience the love of God. The greatest feeling in the world is knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and knowing that God loves you, and God is backing you up, and God is your friend. I remember when I received Jesus at 20, That love that I felt that day has never left me. I know that God loves me. There there was once a a brilliant man. He was like one of these top geniuses in the world. There are many top academics and people in the world. And he was world renowned. And uh, he did the speech. And then all these top kids in the college were allowed to ask questions and they were asking him very high level questions and of science and the the universe and everything and he was giving them all the correct answers and uh, the one student said, what is the most profound thing you've ever heard in your life? And now they're all waiting for like Einstein's theory and Newton's theory and all these great revelations and he said, Jesus loves me, this I know 
for the Bible tells me so. One of the great academics of the world, Jesus loves me, this I know. How do we know? How do we know that he loves us? Because the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, we are the whosoevers, whosoever, One John four sixteen, and we know have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. And John fifteen nine, as the Father loved me, I've loved you. Abide in my love. The second thing we need to do is have a revelation of. The fact that we need to stay rooted in his love. So it's one thing for us to know that God loves us, but we need to stay there. Why do some people backslide and stop serving the Lord, stop living for the Lord? Because they take their eyes off God. They put their eyes and they focus on the things of the world, the, 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 the trials of life, the deceitfulness of riches, the pride of life. And God encourages us to stay rooted in him. It's not on the screen, but I, I, I did it late last night. I was thinking about it. John chapter 15, verse four, where Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. We need to abide in God. Remember, when you receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you and with you. You are in him and he is in you. You are abiding together. You live in together. You fellowship in together. Rooted means cause to grow. It means to be developed by something and not influenced by it. Rooted in his love helps you to love him and others. It's easy to love him, God, knowing that he first loved us. It's unfair to say to people that don't know the Lord, you need to love God, you need to love God. No, first things first, you need to know how much God loves you. And when you know how much God loves you, you can be rooted in that love. Ephesians chapter 4, 4 verses 2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So to stay rooted and grounded in that love, we need to follow the Lord and his word. No longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should bear good fruits. God wants you to bear good fruits. And that your fruit should remain. So what does Satan do? Satan wants you to take your eyes off God. To stop fellowshipping with God. Because when you stop fellowshipping with God, you start to doubt his love. If you don't hang around your, your spouse or, or your best friend for, for a really long time, days, weeks, months, you're going to start to think, do they still love me? And if you don't spend that time with God, you might start to doubt his love. And let me tell you, our enemy, the devil, will come in there and he will challenge you, he will sow bad seed and say, does God really still love you? Remember what you did last Tuesday. Look how you lost your temper. Look how you sinned. Look how unlovable you are. Surely God can't love you. And when you start to doubt God's love for you, you stop coming to him. You're scared to approach God. And when you are fearful of God and you're scared to approach him, you start to doubt that he will bless you. 
you start to doubt that he will provide for you. So what Satan wants to do, he wants you to get out of the love zone, the faith zone, and get into the doubt and unbelief zone. Because if he can get you into this zone where you start doubting God, he can get you into sin. Because the Bible says whatever's not done in faith is sin. So if you think, oh, I, I can't come to God and ask him for this or, or trust him for that, then you sin in. God wants us to come boldly into his throne room of grace. The Bible says those that come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So if you think he's not a rewarder, then you get into doubt and unbelief. Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 says, But faith working through love. So if he can get you to fall out of love with God, then he can get you to doubt God, and he will get you out of faith. And whatever's not done in faith is sin. The third thing we need to do is we need to love each other. Especially if you're sitting next to your husband, wife, and kids, God wants us to love each other, protect each other, provide for each other, help each other. And I know Valentine's coming up, and whether you as a Christian believe in Valentine's Day or not, I mean, some of us, we, I don't even know the origins of Valentine's Day. Let me be honest with you. I know Valentino was a, was a romantic guy, and who knows what happened. But even on that day, we should have Valentine's Day every day. But just make sure next week when it's Valentine's Day, husbands, you take your wife out for dinner. Get a babysitter to watch the kids. Amen. <laughs> and, and don't wait until next week to book. Book today. Guys, go on one of the apps and book your spot, your table. I was, I was going online. It's a, even this week it was tough. I got like a 5.30, 5.45 Dinner. Otherwise, the next one was at like nine o'clock. But make sure you book your spot. Amen. And for those of you that are maybe great chefs, prepare something romantic at home. Amen. And uh, it's going to be a great day. <laughs> now we need to love each other. Amen. 1 John 4, 7, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So how do we love people? Through him. Because let's just be honest, some people are a little bit unlovable. <laughs> now that's none of you here today. I'm saying some people, it's difficult to love them. They're lying, cheating, stealing, unforgiving, blasphemous, cursing, womanizing. I mean, there's some tough people to love. But that's why it's impossible to love people in the natural. We have to put his super on our natural and love people supernaturally. And as an evangelist, the Lord honestly gave me this anointing whereby I see people through God's eyes. Now, sometimes my glasses come on and I quickly have to throw them off because that's when I start being critical but love the Lord through his lens, through his eyes. Especially when people don't know Jesus, they, they go know, they're like the blind leading the blind. They, they are puppets in the devil's puppet show. He's pulling all the strings. He's the one manipulating them. Demons are using them. 
And sometimes it's really hard to love those people. That's why we need to pray for their salvation. Lord, give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Pray to the Lord of the harvest for laborers to reach them. Maybe you're one of those laborers. Maybe it's tough to reach them, especially maybe one of them is your next door neighbor, not the, the most lovable person on earth. Leave them a Jesus DVD. They won't know who dropped it off. Next week, leave a, a salvation book. Next week, leave another book. And, and start reaching out to them. So he's instructing us to love each other. And how do we do it? Through verse 8. We might live through him. Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is how God sees us. This is how we should be acting and behaving. It's like you may be destined to be Roger Federer. You're destined to win 20 grand slams, 103 titles, worth six, seven hundred million dollars. But now you're six years old. And let's just say I'm a prophet and I know your true destiny I need to start from the beginning. I need to start teaching you the fundamentals of how to hold the grip, how to move your feet, how to move on the court, how to practice, how to strategize. And the same thing is true with the word of God. We have so much potential to do great things, but God wants us to do it his way. We don't want to be man-made men, woman-made men. We want to be God-made people. We want to do it God's way. When they say, how on earth did you win this award? We want to give glory to God. When they say, how on earth did you grow this amazing company? We want to give glory to God. When they say, how did you come up with this amazing idea? We want to give glory to God. And as we lift Jesus up, he will lift us up. Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, my earth suit, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We love because he first loved us. Remember Jesus spoke about the, the, the one servant? And the servant owed the master, like, let's just say, uh, $1,000. But there were, were other servants that owed this guy, like, collectively, maybe $100. But because all the other servants couldn't pay this servant $100, the servant who was owed $100 had all the other servants locked up. But the servant who owed the master a thousand the master said you know what I'm going to forgive all your debts and even though all the debts were forgiven first that servant that was forgiven wasn't willing to forgive all the other servants and the bible says when the master found out he was really mad and had that servant thrown in jail so Jesus was teaching us guys I've forgiven you so much you're on your way to heaven. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. All I'm asking you to do is to love. Not in your own strength because it's very difficult. I, I'm actually so impressed when non-believers are such loving people. Some of them are, are really loving people, kind, generous, helpful. I think it's amazing. How much more can us who have been forgiven so much we know we were on our way to hell and Jesus died on the cross for us. And because of that act, all he asks us to do is to love one another. Amen. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love, but we love him because he first loved us. And the final encouragement I want to give is the fact that love requires action. 
Luke chapter 19, verse 1 to 9, I won't read through it, but we all know the story about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, Jewish guy, very, very wealthy. And he heard that Jesus was coming to town. He climbed up into a sycamore tree. Jesus passed by. Everyone saw Jesus looking at Zacchaeus and they were so happy that finally someone with God's authority was going to rebuke Zacchaeus and tell him what a filthy, rotten scoundrel he was. But what did Jesus do? Hello, Zacchaeus. Hi. I think Zacchaeus nearly fell out the tree. Because why has Jesus been so kind to me? Jesus went back to his house. And when you read scripture, it doesn't actually say that Jesus even said anything. Now he may have, but it, it doesn't teach us in the Bible that Jesus even had a conversation. But put yourself in Zacchaeus's position. He knew he had cheated people that he had robbed people on their taxes. Those people obviously didn't have a good Jewish tax accountant working for them. So if you owed $100, the kiss would collect $100 for the Romans and he would collect $100 for himself and he became a very wealthy man. So because Zacchaeus is feeling so loved by Jesus that Jesus would grace his house, he goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I give half my money, I'm giving half my money to the poor. And if I've stolen from anyone, I give back fourfold. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to your house. You see, Zacchaeus had an encounter with God and he reciprocated. You could see that he had a changed life. I know when I received Jesus, I sent text messages to all people that I'd hurt or, or be nasty to. And I said, please apologize for my behavior. I didn't know, I, I take full blame. I'm so sorry I hurt you. But something great happened in my life a few days ago. I received Jesus and please forgive me. And what will happen with non-believers? They'll, they'll, they'll think, first of all, you've lost your mind. <clears throat> but then the Holy Spirit will say, the same can happen with you. And if you've stolen anything physically, bring it back. When I went with Reinhard Bonnke on many of his crusades, I went to like 20 crusades around the world with him. He would preach on Zacchaeus. And you know what would happen in the days following? The police would be inundated with so much stuff that was returned, stolen stuff that people were returning to the police station. Because some of them were too scared to give it directly at the person's house. So they returned all their stolen goods to the police station. So if you've stolen anything, return it to the police station. Say you found it or, or go to the person's house and put it on their doorstep. Make sure there's no camera. Those, those cameras that can, I don't want you to get in trouble. You've received Jesus. Okay. And if you've hurt anyone, write them a letter. Or, or if you know them really well, just say, sorry, I've messed up. I, I, I've really cheated you so badly. Forgive me. There's no excuse. Be repentant and ask the Lord to help you not do that again. Amen. James 2, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith with my works. So we love one another with works. We buy gifts, we, we write letters, we send text messages, we, we, we tell people thank you, we're so, we're so grateful. We need to appreciate each other. We need to say the words, thank you. Thank you. If someone blesses you, say thank you. Look them in the eyes. I, I tell my kids, if anyone gives you even an orange, look them in the eyes and say Thank you. And I want to say thank you to all of you for all that you do for the Lord, all that you do for the church, those of you that come so early, those of you that pack up when we finish, those of you that run the connect groups, the outreaches, those of you that give financially. 
thank you for all that you do, all the worship team, all the practice, everything that goes on behind the scenes, thank you. And I pray that God blesses you for it, amen? Let's all close our eyes. Father God, thank you that we can receive that divine revelation right now that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that there is absolutely no doubt in anyone's mind, in anyone's heart of the love that you have for them. Holy Spirit, show everyone, please, how much you love them. And Jesus, we know how much you loved us because you died for us. And maybe you're here today, you've never received Jesus. You've never invited Jesus into your life. You can do it right now. All you have to do is open your heart and ask Jesus to come in. He will forgive you. He will love you forever. He'll put a crown on your head, a ring on your finger, and you will be in divine union with God here on earth every moment of every day. You will have someone in this world that will be there for you 24-7. The king of the universe as your personal friend. Loving you, living with you, advising you, counseling you helping you make the right decisions. Maybe you are watching on social media and you also want to receive Jesus. You can. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if that's you right now, if you want to receive Jesus for the first time or you want to recommit your life to Him, while your eyes are closed, if that's you, I want you to quickly put up your hand. If you want Jesus to come into your life. Amen. I see that hand. I see that hand. Amen. While everyone's eyes are closed, let's pray this prayer. Even you watching on TV. Say, Jesus, I believe in my heart that, my, that you are my Lord and Savior. And right now I give my life to you. My spirit, my soul, and my body. Everything I have, everything I am, I give to you. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. In Jesus' name.